Hello, this is Rob from Modern Life Survivalist, and um, we're at a red alert in our country right now um, for Christians all across the country because um, right now church is illegal for the first time in my life, and um, at least in my state, uh, Maryland, uh, Governor Hogan, um, we're going to get into the details of what he has, what executive orders he has made, and um, what what that entails. And um, I have my pastor here from Cornerstone Evangelical Free Church in Pasadena, Maryland, and the Institute on the Constitution in, that's in Severna Park. Pasadena as well, yeah, Pasadena as well. As well, Pasadena, right? <laughs> yeah, I, sometimes I think it's Annapolis, but I guess it's all close together but um he's been in the uh political sphere as well as the sphere of faith-based organizations and and he's been a pastor for uh well why don't you tell us about thank you well, thank you for having me on your channel a, a privilege to be able to share these truths yes i've been pastoring for over 30 years uh, more than 25 of those years here in Maryland, uh, and uh, about 25 of those as pastor of Cornerstone Evangelical Free Church. And uh, while I've also been serving as the senior instructor at Institute on the Constitution, uh, the organization that teaches our founders' view of law and government, which many people are surprised when we go back and look at what our founders actually said, not what other people said about what they said, but what they actually said is they were creating a republic that was based upon God's law as the foundation. That's what they meant when they referred in the Declaration of Independence to the laws of nature and nature's God. They were referring to the God of the Bible and to his law, which is given to us in his word. And so his word was the foundation. Where do you get the property rights that you have under our Constitution? Well, you get those property rights from Almighty God. They don't come from government. In fact, in the Declaration of Independence, they clearly state that government exists, its whole purpose for existence is to protect and secure your God-given rights. Your rights come from God, not from government, and therefore your right to property, where does it come from? Clearly the, the Ten Commandments, the Eighth Commandment says, thou shalt not steal, therefore you have a right to property, because if you are under a communist system of government, you have no right to property, no property rights whatsoever. The government owns it all, the government in the communist system really is God, and uh, it grants you privileges or licenses to do anything. And if it grants you a license, of course, the next day it could take the license away from you and say, yeah, you know, we granted you the privilege to go out of your house for one hour a day, but eh, we decided that's not a good idea. We're not going to grant you that privilege anymore. So there's a huge difference between rights as our founders uh, uh, established in our, our Declaration, our Constitution, and, and Bill of Rights, that our rights come from God, not from government. And the job of government is to protect and secure those God-given rights. And so I've been teaching for 20 years uh, with Institute on the Constitution. Our website, if you're interested in checking that out, and many resources available there, is theamericanview.com. All one word, theamericanview.com. But also, I'd encourage you to go to our church website at Cornerstone, because I preach these matters where the word of God intersects with political issues of the day or the questions about law and government and so on. I speak to those matters and there's a whole uh, I have 10 years or more of sermons available. And that website is C for Cornerstone, E for Evangelical, F for Free, C for Church, MD for Maryland. So C-E-F-C-M-D dot O-R-G. And uh, those sermons are available uh, audio as well as uh, probably there's five or six years available of video uh, now. And so we're, we're privileged to be able to teach these things in our country. And uh, that'll be down in the description. Um, and I want to also recommend if you're watching this video, which is about the coronavirus uh, reaction or overreaction um, to just watch the last couple weeks of sermons which were held at a at a, a, a place of meeting for cornerstone and uh, they were held even under this unlawful edict 
That's all I wanted to say about okay. that. Yeah, I just wanted to tell them to watch your, uh, yes. your sermons about, because it's about what we're going to talk about. We do not obey unlawful edicts, and no one should obey unlawful edicts. Consider what happened in My Lai during Vietnam. Uh, an order was given to massacre everyone in the village. And oddly enough, they said, we've got to kill the people in order to save the village. What? Yeah, let's kill all the people in order to save the village. So you could compare that to what's taking place in America. Let's kill the Constitution to save America. Uh-uh, that is not how you save America. That's the exact opposite of how you save our country. But uh, those unlawful edicts as a church, we refuse to obey because no civil government has the authority over the church of Jesus Christ. That is the true church of Jesus Christ. He is the head. He is the Lord. He is the master. And we obey him, as the apostles were famous to say in Acts chapter 5, to the officials who were telling them in a similar fashion, issuing an edict not to preach anymore in the name of Jesus. They said, we'll let you go. We've beaten you. We've imprisoned you. And now we're going to release you. But you must not preach in the name of Jesus anymore. And they said to those officials, whether it's, in, it's in right in the sight of God to obey you more than God, you judge. But as for us, we ought to obey God rather than men. And so when push comes to shove, true Christians throughout the history of the Church of Jesus Christ have always obeyed God, even when the civil government commanded them to do the exact opposite of, uh, of what uh, our, our Lord commanded us in his word. Right. And... We're going to get into the actual edict, um, and you know th that kind of summarizes uh, your um, your philosophy of of uh, uh, civil government and how the church is supposed to respond and participate. And could I just quickly get your take? Uh, we've discussed this a lot, but could I quickly get just a, a summary of why you think it's important for the church to participate because i've let me in my experience before mm -hmm. i knew about cornerstone um and really was paying attention to really paying attention to the news and alternative news i guess um i did i just kind of did what what a standard republican or a standard conservative christian would do which is just attend church and like politics you you do vote right they do they do say go ahead and vote but they didn't tell you who you should vote for or why and uh you know it was very passive so and that you would you would be challenged for saying you that um you're involved in politics you know you shouldn't uh try to rock the boat too much because because of romans 13 or something like that so why is it important for a christian to be involved and kind of actively almost uh counter to the the mainstream politics well first if we ask what's the purpose of the church that's where we got to start at the very basics the purpose of the church jesus gives it to us in his last instructions to his disciples in matthew 28 uh, 18 and following where he begins by saying all authority is given unto me that is unto jesus christ all authority that is there is no authority outside of the authority of Jesus Christ. And people would say, okay, we understand that's in heaven. But no, Jesus says, all authority is given unto me in heaven and on earth. All authority is on, on earth is his, which means there is no human authority that can rightly act unless it's acting in accordance with the authority it derives from the Lord Jesus Christ. And of course, Jesus never gives anyone authority to disobey his commands. None, none whatsoever. So if some human authority, and we'll put that in quotes because they're claiming authority, claims to be able to contradict the Lord Jesus Christ, commanding you to dump, do something that's opposite of what Jesus has commanded. They have no authority to do so because they are not deriving their authority from the Lord Jesus Christ. So mm -hmm. we go from that to say, well, what's the purpose of the church? And Jesus clearly told his disciples, go into all the world and make disciples of every nation, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and teaching them to observe, that is to obey all that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. Amen. Mm -hmm. So clearly, disciple-making means we share the gospel. Those who come to faith in Jesus Christ 
there's two things that must be done to make a disciple. The first is to baptize them. So we baptize uh, believers into the waters of baptism in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But that doesn't end the, pro the project of making a disciple. Rather, that's almost the first startup of making a disciple because the rest of it involves teaching them to obey everything Jesus commanded. And by the way, people want to reduce that and say, oh, that just means the red letters in the New Testament. That, because those, those are the words of Jesus and, don't, and nothing other but the red letters. That's a false narrative because John chapter 1 tells us that Jesus Christ is the word of God. That is every word of the scripture, all 66 books, both Old and New Testament. They are the word of the Lord Jesus Christ. And therefore, and I've, uh, I've come across that before. Yeah in my travels where they, they say, I believe the teachings of Jesus. <laughs> yeah. Or and if the teachings of Jesus, if you truly understand, is the whole Bible from start to finish. Right. It really is because in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you're, that's a very great point you're making. So if we're going to teach everything Jesus commanded, that means we got to look and see the commands that Jesus made. And the commands that Jesus made don't just regard our own personal obedience to Christ. Indeed, we are to be self-governed. We're to obey God's law as a disciple of Jesus Christ. That's the, the first stage, but it doesn't end there. We need to extend beyond self-government into family government. Now, Rob, you're a father and a husband, and all those scriptures that relate to what a father and a husband is supposed to do for his wife and his children, and what, how he is supposed to conduct his family and raise the children and nurture and admonition of the Lord. There's a whole host of things in scripture about family government and what family government should be doing. For example, to whom has God, or to whom has the Lord Jesus Christ, given the responsibility to educate children? Did he give it to civil government? No, not at no, all. Yeah, no, the children. family, which people are learning now exactly. because they're yes. homeschooling. Right, as course. you guys <laughs> that's, <laughs> And that's what families should be doing. They should take back the education of the children and do as Christ commands them to educate their own children. Now they may hire someone to help them, you know, a Christian school or a tutor. Or, oh, and these days with homeschooling, there's a multitude of resources to help. But anyway, so that's an illustration of we need to take not just self-government and obey Christ in our own life. We need in family government to understand the commands of Christ, how that relates to the family government, and what it means to obey Christ in our family government. But it doesn't right, end and that. that's the center of, or that's the basis for all, all, all the government. Amen. Well, actually, I guess we're starting with, um, I guess that's earthly government, but I guess the real basis would be the, the word of God or, or mm -hmm. Christ and um and then you're saying where where does the constitution fit in for let instance? me let me get there in a moment because okay. the next level of government beyond a, a family government is church government and indeed as we grow as a disciple of jesus christ we find that there's responsibilities we have in the body of christ the church of jesus christ was ordained by him that we are a body we're related to one another interconnected with one another we need one another all those things, there's a huge amount of commands and responsibilities God has given to the church government. In fact, when it comes to the whole subject of welfare in society, it does not belong to the civil government. And that's what we're being told here with the $2 trillion bailout. Oh, look, Big Brother's going to come along here and help you out by giving you this check for your family and your welfare is going to depend on the civil government. No, no, no. We're going to see that God's word never ever gives civil government the responsibility of welfare. Rather, he gives the responsibility of welfare first to the family government. You read in 1 Timothy, the restrictions there. It's like, if anyone does not care for his own family, that's take the responsibility of his own family, he's worse than an infidel, that is an unbeliever. So clearly, family is where charity, where welfare should start. And if someone does not have a family, as Timothy points out very clearly, Paul to Timothy in 1 Timothy, then and then only is the church to be involved. So first, welfare is a family government issue. And if there's no family, then it becomes a church government issue. But it never goes to the next level of government, civil government. Mm. Now, many people like to say, well, the Bible has nothing to say. There's no prescription about civil government. We could just ignore anything that the, the, the Bible says about government, civil government, because 
It only speaks to self-government, family government, and church government. But that is a falsehood. Jesus clearly said when he was being tested by a group of uh, lawyers that were trying to trick him, and they were trying to trick him on the question of taxation because they knew that's a hot button issue. You know, if Jesus answers this wrong, he's going to lose a whole lot of followers. But if he answers it the way we think he will, then he'll be in trouble with the Romans. They'll come and arrest him, and we'll be done with Jesus. Well, Jesus was very uh, uh, alive to what they were attempting to do to him and, and right. trap him. So he answered very craftily. He said, "Render." He said, give me a coin. Let me see. And whose image and superscription is on this coin? And they all answered, it's Caesar's. And so he said, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's and unto God the things that are God's. So Jesus was saying Caesar has a right area of jurisdiction that God has ordained human civil government to do a certain limited set of things, but only that limited set of things was civil government to be involved with. Outside mm -hmm. of that, God obviously says that we're to give all of ourselves to him, to be his servants, and that uh, civil government must be uh, kept within the boundaries that God establishes in his word. So civil government should never break in the boundary of the family government and steal education and require compulsory attendance laws that say, if you don't send your kids to our school, we're going to fine you and prison you or whatever. That's illegal. That's against God's law. Because what about, God, what about doing be, the testing? Yes. He never yeah. gave education right. ever to the, the, the realm of civil government. It belongs to family government. Church right. government can come along, family government to help in that, but never civil government. It's never their job. So well, I've noticed too, like the one of the problems with all of this is it's almost unfixable now because they've provided that as a crutch for people right. so long, just like insurance and, and all these things that really the community or the, the real community, the church community doesn't like to step in and and you know, I, I think there's something to be said for a, a child who goes un uneducated, right? Mm -hmm. But you know, the church can kind of step in. in and the church has in the history of our country. I do a DVD, which is available at our um, the American View website, The History of Education. And you'll be astonished to see the people before public education was invented. Mm -hmm. It did not exist in the founding era. It did not exist in the first uh, 70 years of our country. Before public education was invented, we had the best education in the world, mm -hmm. bar none far better than Europe. We had a hundred percent literacy rate in some cities in America during that period of time. Right. And we have fallen and we have a far worse education system because it's been taken over by the civil government rather than where it belongs with the family government and the help of the church government. But let me go back to what Jesus said. He not only set boundaries on, on Caesar's uh, authority, but he said, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's. So he was saying, there's certain taxes Caesar uh, imposes upon you that are righteous and therefore ought to be paid. You ought to render to Caesar those taxes. But he wasn't just saying taxes. He's saying there are things that you owe to civil government. And Paul takes this in Romans 13 and expands on it. He says, give honor to whom honor is due, tribute to whom tribute is due, etc. So within the limited jurisdictional boundaries of civil government, there are certain things that we, the citizens, as Christians, as disciples of Jesus Christ, we need to be taught what the word of God says we owe to our civil government. Now let's think for a moment of what kind of government they had back there in Rome. It was an empire and there was an emperor, the Caesar, who sat on the throne and basically his command was the law. Whatever he said was the law. And of course, uh, he did some wicked and un-Christian un things with his law. But Jesus is saying, within what you as a Christian can obey, within the laws of God, you need to obey what it is Caesar's commanding. Mm. Let's take that into our day and ask the question, who is Caesar in America? Is it the president of the United States? Or is it the governors of the 50 states? Or is it, like a lot of people believe, the Supreme Court? So nine lawyers dressed in black robes, they hand down their edict that redefines marriage, and we all bow down. Oh, great ones. Oh, honorable ones. Oh, we worship at your feet. You have redefined marriage. Therefore, we will all obey your redefinition of marriage. Hogwash. God is the one who defined marriage. And those wicked, black-robed lawyers, that's all they are, lawyers wearing black robes, <laughs> they who determined that they could redefine marriage, they are minions of Satan 
on the road to hell if they do not repent of their wickedness of thinking they could overthrow God's law of marriage. God never gave civil government the power or authority to redefine marriage. So who's Caesar in America? Not the Supreme Court. It's not the president or the executives, the governors. It's not the legislature, nor is it any of the state legislatures or any of the bureaucrats, the millions of bureaucrats in federal and state government. They are not Caesar in America. Well, who is it? The Constitution says it. The Constitution is the supreme law of the land. Article 6 of the Constitution, clearly, it is the supreme law of the land, and it demands obedience. In fact, every elected official and every appointed official swears an oath, and whether they realize it or not, they're swearing that oath to the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm. They will obey the Constitution because it is supreme. In other words, the Constitution is Caesar if we take Jesus's words and paraphrase it, render unto the Constitution, dear citizen in these United States, render unto the Constitution that which is demanded of you by the Constitution. Wow. So, so that's there's your, there's your Romans 13, right? Exactly. How could a Christian obey Jesus's command to render unto the Constitution if they've never studied the Constitution, their federal Constitution or their state Constitution, which is why at Institute on the Constitution, we've developed a course with a biblical foundation and linking it back to the scriptures continually, a course on the U.S. Constitution and a course on the Maryland Constitution. We hope to have courses on the other 49 states uh, of, of our, our republic because Christians need to understand what their duty is when they go to the polls. Who do you choose? By what standard do you choose them? It must be the Constitution. You're to render the Constitution. What do you do when you serve on a jury? I'm currently teaching a class on Fridays and invite you into the first Friday. If you go to the website, theamericanview.com, you can get in on tomorrow's uh, uh, class, tomorrow evening, because we're going to be teaching the power the jury has, because you have a vote at the ballot box. You have a vote as a pettit juror, and you have a vote as a grand juror, these very powerful votes, but you cannot fulfill your duty in those three roles unless you understand the Constitution and unless you understand the foundations beneath it, which are the Declaration of Independence. Mm. Let me uh, share this share this passage just for a visual. Um, Romans 13. And what you're saying is this is not the governor. This is not right. the um, this is not the president. This is not the Supreme Court. This is actually talking about the constitution of our, our land. Right. Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities. What most people never bother to ask is, what does the scripture mean by those governing authorities? It goes on to say, for there is no authority except from God. We'll go back for a minute to the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. They believe they have the authority to redefine marriage or they never would have heard the case Obersfeld at all. They would have said, this is out of our jurisdiction. We cannot do a thing about it. What did they do? They proceeded because they believed they had authority to redefine marriage, which God never gave to them. Therefore, they, the Supreme Court, are not being referred to in Romans 13. They are not the governing authorities because they are in rebellion against the true authority, God's holy word. If they were in submission to God's word, as historically, if you go back 100 years or more, actually, you got to go back almost more than 100 years now, the, that was the understanding. The Supreme Court said, of course, we know we cannot define, redefine the laws of nature. Nature's God. There's an almighty God, the creator of the universe, who made all things. And his law, the physical laws of the universe, chemistry, physics, mathematics, all those laws are unchangeable. And the moral laws of the universe, i.e. marriage and what marriage is, they are as unchangeable as the physical laws of the universe. So the <laughs> current Supreme Court just defies Romans 13, and it, Romans 13 in the text itself shows that these people are not the governing authorities. These are just, um, well, shills of Satan. Not all of them. There's some that are good, Thomas, <laughs> and all, but uh, many of them are just shills for Satan and are servants of Satan seeking to destroy the God-given rights that we, the people, have uh, had secured to us by our Constitution. And that kind of comes back in to education, because yeah, yeah. how many people, not I was going to say kids, how many people actually have this education that we have three branches of government, and even so, it's like, who's my boss? Who's the guy who, uh, oh, it's the, the sheriff, it's the 
you know, whoever's like got a, a baton, I guess, coming after you as the boss most of the time. But, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, it, you, you, what do you tell them? No, well, the Constitution is what all of that is derived from. And so that's the law of the land. So to, now I, that helps me a lot because I can go, I can go to somebody and say, uh, I mean, if someone comes to me and, and brings up Romans 13 ever again, I actually didn't have this, this, um, this, this truth um, dagger as you, as, <laughs> as a will to, to fight with. So that's great, Pastor Dave. You know, I mean, Pastor Dave has been doing this how many years again? Oh, 20 plus years at this point. 20 plus years. And you ran for office? I ran for office four times. So right. State uh, level, state delegate, ran for state delegate, uh, ran for county commissioner, uh, ran for central committee uh, twice. So yeah, four different times I ran for office. Wonderful. And, and Part, that is... Like you say, most, most people don't have this education. So when you talk like this, they say, you're insane because I've never heard this ever before. Nobody around me believes what you just stated. Therefore, you must be crazy. And I say, well, then you're saying Thomas Jefferson, Benjamin Franklin, George Washington, all the founders were crazy because this is their worldview. This is what they believed about law and government. And this was what was believed for the first 150 years by every American. In fact, you couldn't call yourself an American without believing this. And uh, sadly, like you say, this education has been lost. Obviously, it's not taught in the public indoctrination system they call schools. And most Christian churches don't mention it from the pulpit at all. So most people have never heard it before. And it's a radical idea when they hear it. And they, at first, often cannot believe it's true. And I just say, don't believe and take my word for it. Go back and read what our founders clearly, read, clearly said in, in what they wrote. Because it's there. And it's very clear that they believe these things sincerely. Right. And, and it's not just because they were such great guys and they're, they're the law of the land either. It's because, I mean, the, the, the default, I guess, is your civic, your civic law or your, Christ commanded us that you're rendering unto Caesar. What is it? So if we grew up in like a, um, I don't know, a, something different, like a parliamentary monarchy or something, Mm -hmm. And you follow, you would follow their constitution or? You yes, would, but yeah. only to the extent that right. their commands were in accordance with God's commands. Right. So when the apostles were told by their government in, in Jerusalem, their government, the Jewish rulers told them no longer preach in the name of Christ. They said, no, we ought to obey God rather than man. So one of the critical things we need to understand that government has specific limitations that the word of God places upon it. Those boundaries are spelled out in the word of God. And Again, I do that a lot in my preaching as well as in my, my teaching. Those boundaries need to be understood because when the civil government transgresses those boundaries, then when it's transgressing that boundary, we have no obligation to obey it in the transgression. In fact, we have an obligation to resist it and refuse to obey it. And I believe what we're facing right now with these governor's edicts is an example where the civil government has transgressed the boundaries of God and God's law, the laws of nature, nature's God, the vertical standard, but they've also transgressed the horizontal standard, that is the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of Maryland, and what, what we'll talk about, the Constitution of the State of Maryland is throughout all, all 50 constitutions as well. The same protections are built into those constitutions that we enjoy here in Maryland. Um, I'm going to pull up uh, Hogan's edict here, at least the best I could do to find it. And the governor's we're website. Gonna look, we're going to look at that edict, okay? And this was my um, my way of finding it. I actually went on his Twitter account, and that led me to governor.maryland.gov. But I heard announced on the radio these the, these edicts, you know, and that always has some con some degree of interpretation behind it too. At least they aired his actual voice, but you know, even I, I wanted to see in writing what are, what is it we're dealing with, and so I got here and um, let's see here, a stay-at-home order effective tonight. So this was like a press release, okay, 
uh, and this was the closest I could find to what the actual edict is. Uh, and it, it's all, it's just an article, really. Like, it's a press release, so I, I don't really understand how is someone even supposed to understand what they're supposed to do. But anyway, we'll read this article, and maybe you can tell me where the actual edict is, like, codified. <laughs> but we've got, we are no longer asking or suggesting that Marylanders stay home. We are directing them to do so. Sounds but like the, a to me. Mm-hmm. And the, but the language is kind of interpretive as it is. So here's, it says, below is a comprehensive list of the actions the administration announced today. Stay at home order. No Maryland resident should be leaving their home unless it is for an essential job or an essential reason, such as obtaining food or medicine, seeking urgent medical attention, or for other necessary purposes, which that isn't even spelled out. But I looked into it more and from what he said, he said things like, oh yes, you can go out for recreational activities and or you know, to go to the, that was the main one. And I said, well, anyone can go out and say outdoor recreation, you know, so already I, I, you have, you have your pass, but you shouldn't even need a pass. I'm just saying you can always say to the, the, if you get pulled over, <laughs> you know, I'm on essential business. Yeah. You, right. But even so, it, what, what would your be advice? What would your advice be in that situation based on what you see here? Do, does somebody who gets pulled over like assert their constitutional right or do we come up with an you know, excuse within the parameters of what the language is? What is a better? Right, it depends on how much battle you want to go, with, go to with the police officer that's pulling you over. By the way, I was yesterday in a tire store because an essential thing for me was to get a tire repair that was leaking. That's essential. Otherwise, Your horse was in a ditch. <laughs> so this is an essential thing. Mm -hmm. um, but talking with the fellow at the counter or overhearing him in the conversation on the phone, he was talking about what had happened earlier that day just outside that store in Severna Park. Next door was an empty uh, parking lot of a, a, a Starbucks because Starbucks was closed. And the police lined up and directed everyone on Ritchie Highway, Route 2, into the Starbucks parking lot. To question them as to why they were on the road, was this it? Is, this is Baltimore County, or oh, this is Anne Arundel County. Oh my God. Then uh, he also said a police yeah. officer came in, and it was a police officer who who he knew, so he thought maybe it's a friendly visit, you know. But the question he was asked was shocking to him. He answered it, but the first question is, "How many customers are you having? Are you having a, a normal flow, or are you having, you know, kind of a, get a number of how many customers?" And this is this the normal level of customers or are, are there fewer customers? And then he asked the question that shocked this, uh, this store manager. Are those people coming in for an essential reason? How many are coming in for an essential reason? And the guy responded, all of them, you know, right response. When the, when the evil dictator demands of you a response, really you owe him like Rahab. You do not owe him the truth. Look at Joshua and the, the uh -huh. battle there, Jericho. Rahab told the spies who came from the government, she told them a flat out lie. She did not owe these enemies of herself and her family and the enemies of Israel, the enemies of the people of God. She did not owe them the truth and she did not tell them the truth. Quite clearly, mm -hmm. she said, oh, they went that way. If you go, you're going to be able to, you're going to, be able to catch them when in fact, the Jewish spies, the Hebrew spies were on her roof, hidden under the flax. So it's very clear she recognized she did not owe them the, the truth. And the word of God praises her. She's one of the women that's the few women that's listed in the hall of faith in Hebrews chapter 11. They were praised for actually defying the orders of the king. So when the king does something illegal, illegitimate, which is what this whole thing is about here with this order to stay home, we do not owe any of his officers, any of his minions, the truth. And so I, if anybody pulls me over, I say, I am on essential business. In fact, <laughs> I am a servant of the king of the universe to whom you are going to stand one day and have to give an account for your actions today on judgment. And by the way, you swore an oath to the Maryland Constitution. Have you ever read the Maryland Constitution? Do you know what you swore an oath to uphold? Uh, every police officer I've ever talked to, including ones I've questioned in court, because every time I go to court, 
dragged a police officer in. I asked them if they've read the Maryland Constitution that they swore an oath to. Universally, they've said, no, I have not. <laughs> huh. Well, how can you be a law enforcement officer if you don't know the law? <laughs> and the most, most fundamental basic law is the Constitution of Maryland, and they don't know the Constitution of Maryland. Last time I was in court, I asked the police officer if his chief of police had ever encouraged him to even read the Maryland Constitution. And he admitted, no, they have not. Sadly, that exact chief police I have offered to give a free course on the Maryland Constitution to all of his police officers. Mm. His response is, well, that's not necessary. Hmm. So I would encourage everyone to print out the 47 Declaration of Rights. This is the Bill of Rights of the state of Maryland. In Maryland, and go, if you're not in Maryland, go to that state uh, constitution. Print out the Bill of Rights for your constitution. Look at it carefully and thoroughly. If we have time here today, we'll look at uh, Article 44 of our Declaration of Rights and some other articles that- I'm pulling it up right now. Let's, yeah, let's take you know, and, and say, police officer, do you understand what this means? Do you understand that you've been given orders that are in violation of this document, the Constitution of the State of Maryland, that you swore an oath to uphold? So if you're a law enforcement officer, sir, and we always want to be respectful, don't want to get nasty, negative, we just want to ask them questions. Sir, you swore an oath to this document. Have you ever read these words? Does it appear to you that these words comport with the commands that you have been given to do this, uh, you know, this check on all the citizens who are driving down the road? and pull over all the citizens on the road and ask them these questions, do you think? And sir, because you swore an oath to Almighty God, and you're gonna stand before the Lord Jesus Christ on the day of judgment and have to give an account for your actions that you swore an oath to uphold this constitution and your actions currently are in direct violation of uh, that constitution. You wanna click on there the um, Declaration of Rights at the top of the bulleted list there. That, that right on, Declaration right. of Rights, the 47. I just wanted them to see the the URL kind of had a, I just Googled it and I just Googled. Yeah. And it gave me a Wikipedia article. So I just went to like their reference. They didn't have it written out on Wikipedia, right. but right. Um, I wouldn't know though to go to msa.maryland.gov. Right. I would have just Googled it or whatever. But I mean, I'm always worried like it's not going to even. Be and and look at, look at the article number one there of the declaration. By the way, look at it at where it starts. We, the people of the state of Maryland, grateful to almighty God for our civil and religious liberty. Where does our liberty come from? Where do our rights come from? Almighty God, not almighty Hogan. They come from almighty God. And then it says taking into serious consideration the best means of establishing a good constitution in this state for the sure foundation and more permanent security thereof, declare, and then go on with a declaration. But notice it's to secure, the permanent security is not security from disease. No, no, no. It's not security of your income. No, no, no. It's security of your God-given rights. Right. Yeah. Which where the point is. All right. So does this work in tandem, or is it kind of given license? Does the the state constitution derive its power from the U.S. Constitution? So no. Actually, the state constitution existed before the U.S. Constitution. The U.S. Oh. Constitution came in later, 1776. Right. All right. 1776, when they declared independence, they declared all the colonial governments of all 13 colonies abolished. Those colonial gov governors had no more power. They went back to their state capital here in Maryland to Annapolis. And in 1776, they crafted a constitution, which this is derived from. There's been alterations since 1776, but many of the statements you see here in the Declaration of Rights are from 1776. Mm -hmm. So the state constitution existed before the federal constitution. The federal constitution came in into, into existence in 1787 in the Philadelphia Convention in order to delegate certain limited enumerated rights or powers, I shouldn't say rights, excuse me, not rights, certain delegated limited enumerated powers to the federal government that the state governments were ceding to the federal government. One of those was to make war. So rather than Maryland going to war on its own against some enemy, it's like, no, no, no all the states are gonna to go to war, but they're gonna to go to war under the decision made by the federal legislature that declares war, not the legislature of Maryland that declare war. So Maryland as a state, along with the other 13 states, was set, sending some of its delegated powers to the federal government, but it was limited and limited only to that which the constitution of the federal government states. If you're there, if you scroll up for a moment mm -hmm. to, uh, to article uh, number, uh, 
to yeah, the Constitution of the United States and the laws made or which shall be made in pursuance thereof and treaties which made or shall be made under the authority of the United States are and shall be the supreme law of the state and the judges of the state and all people of the state are and shall be bound thereby anything in the constitution or laws of this state to the contrary notwithstanding. What it's saying there is where the, the limited delegated enumerated powers of the federal government are granted in the federal constitution, Maryland has surrendered those, those powers as a state to the federal government. So for example, mm -hmm. consider the war making power. Maryland has no war making power. They've surrendered that by the constitution of the United States to the federal government. What about the issue of education? Education really is never the business of a state government at all, period. But there's nothing in the federal constitution which gives them any jurisdiction over the education of anyone or the power to spend even one penny of taxpayer funding on any education of anyone in America. It's not there in Article One, Section 8. There's the list of the powers that we, the people, have granted to the federal government, these limited delegated enumerated powers. And if it's not in that list of 18 in Article 1, Section 8, the federal government has no power to do it. Therefore, the Federal Department of Education should be abolished. It's illegal. It's criminal. It's a theft on the American people. And the where would that be? Go though? Through a long list of most of the federal departments. They're illegal. They should not be. We didn't grant them the power to do these things. So you're talking about U.S. Constitution, Article yes. 1, Section 8. Article 1, Section 8 lists the uh, powers specifically that Congress has the power to tax and to spend for these limited delegated enumerated powers and nothing beyond those powers. Uh, so, for example, post offices on the, on the list there. Yes, the federal government can have a post office and it's not to the states to have their own individual post office and that involves post roads and so forth. But there's Does any nothing... of this have, well, you were going to do education okay. again? Well, no, I was going to go on to medicine. Yeah, there's that's what I was about to say. Is about there healthcare. anything about biological agents? No, there's nothing about health care whatsoever. So Obamacare is completely unconstitutional. The Medicare and Medicaid, they are also completely unconstitutional. If you go back to the original Constitution, these things have not been amended. We have not granted the federal government any additional powers to do anything about education or health care or a long list of other things the federal government is currently involved in doing that are illegal. In other words, we have a rogue government that is stealing from we the people and spending money that we have never granted it power to do. And the, they get away with doing it because most Americans are ignorant of the US Constitution and they think the federal government can do whatever it bloody well pleases. Well, no, it cannot. Because when they do that, they're in violation of their oath of office and they are gonna stand before Jesus Christ on judgment day and have to give an account for why they lied to him and said they would obey the Constitution and uphold the Constitution, and they proceeded to violate the very terms of that Constitution between we the people and our federal government. And it's the same principle at the state government. Right, and we're, we're dealing, I would say, mainly with a violation of the state Constitution yes. under, I mean, we haven't seen, and you can uh, disagree if you've seen different, but we have not seen the federal government step out of bounds as far as we know. As far as we know, because what I've heard up to this point, unless I've missed something, is their recommendations are being given. Right. And recommendations are a whole different thing than edicts to say, you must do X, Y, and Z. You must stay in your home. You However, must not go to work, and so on. Right. I've watched some of the, have you watched any of the task force videos from Trump? I just caught segments of it that people have excerpted. I haven't watched what? the entirety of them. It scares me because he often, Pence is just like, we've been working with the governors. And then oh. I see the governors making these, you know, uh, these edicts. And just spell out for me, why is this edict, is it uh, the edict to, st let, let me also include the small business one. Um, because I think that was the first violation. So they had already crossed the line, like shutting down non-essential businesses. I don't think they're allowed to do that. They're and then the other one was, you know, the limiting of gatherings. And then that, that essentially gets rid of our ability to gather as a church. So mm -hmm. one, two, three, like what, where are we looking at to see what they did wrong here? Well, Article one right there of the Declaration of Rights right in front of you that all mm -hmm. government of right originates from the people. 
is founded in compact. And that word compact means an agreement, a contract. So if you think of a contract, when you go to get your car repaired, they have you sign this, this piece of paper with a lot of small print on it. If you're smart, you read all that small print so you know the contract you're entering into with the, the car um, uh, repairman. And suppose you go in to get your oil changed in the tune-up and you come back at the end of the day and he says, here's your bill. And you say, $5,000, what? And he says, yeah, I replaced your transmission. And you say, I never gave you authority to replace the transmission. And he says, yeah, right, right here, you signed this piece of paper. It gave me authority to do whatever I thought was best for your car. <laughs> you would never sign such an agreement, would mm. you? No. And if, if he demanded you pay him that, you'd say, no, I'm going to take my car. And say, I'm going to arrest you. I'm going to have you arrested because you're stealing. You'd take it to court. And what would happen in court is that contract you signed with the business owner will be adjudicated to determine who's right and who's wrong. Did you sign a contract to allow him to do whatever right. he chose to? No, of course not. And that's would that apply? Uh, would that apply to? It just makes me think of like those, the all of the privacy ones that kind of trick people into giving. Yes. Up. Yeah, you they can't just say we you you we have your soul now. Which somebody did that as a joke, but it was like scary but they well, can't just say we have your eternal soul right. or your right to access your credit cards and information your social security and steal your right. identity so the, yeah. the, is flow that what power, saying? the flow of power is clearly god who gives rights to human beings individual human beings we have god-given rights and we the people in compact through a constitution have given powers not rights governments have no rights we have given limited, delegated, enumerated powers to the government for the purpose of them securing and protecting our God-given rights. And okay. so it, it's up to we, the people, we, if we did not give Governor Hogan the power to do what he's doing, he is a law breaker. He is okay. not following the obedience that we require of the law makers. And by the way, he cannot make law. The executive never makes law. He can only enforce law that's been made by the legislature. He cannot make law. That's a breach of the separation of powers between the executive branch and the legislative branch. Well, there's got to be, there's something they can do. What, what, what are things they, examples of things they could do as governor, as well, law? He could or make, as he could make recommendations. Okay. He would say, I, like a bully pulpit, I really urge you in this crisis, here's the situation, and we really want to contain this. So we would urge you to stay home. We'd urge you to, to shutter your businesses but he couldn't command anyone to do that. And he should never enforce that advice that he gives with uh, police running around, you know, pulling people off the streets and say, what are you doing out of your house? We don't and, give you permission. Yeah, and what about all this like use of the National Guard? Are they allowed to use them? No, that's for... also a violation, a huge so violation. What are they allowed to use them for? An invasion, right? Well, yes, if there's an invasion of a foreign enemy right. or if there's a crisis, say we have a flood and, and we need help to you know, fill sandbags or, you know, deal with with a crisis on the ground. But this medical crisis that, uh, you know, there's good questions about, but this medical crisis, they have no authority to force the citizens to do something that we, the people, have not granted them power to do in our Constitution. And that's the flow of power most people don't understand. The Constitution is like a, a vice in your shop. You want to get a good hold on a piece of wood, you put it in a vice so you can cut it and, and do what you need to do on it. The vice contains and constrains that piece of wood. And that's what our constitution is to designed to do, constrain the government saying it can only do these things. But if the piece of wood is willful and decides it's gonna undo the vice and it's gonna take over, we, whoa, whoa, wait a minute, we got a monster. We don't have a piece of wood anymore. We got a Frankenstein. And this Frankenstein is out of control, kind of like the story Frankenstein. The monster is created by Dr. Frankenstein and the monster gets out of control and comes to beat up the, the guy who made him. And that's what we have happening. Our government is now out of control like a monster, and it's coming after us. Instead of protecting our God-given rights, it's violating our God-given rights. Just like when you have right. somebody break into your house and steal your goods, that thief is violating the law. He's breaking the law. And so the governor is breaking the Constitution, and that's the supreme law of the state of Maryland. Well, does this article one imply that we in a way are caesar to ourselves yes. because yeah i was going to say because it's people originally are supreme the people are the sovereigns in, right. in our american form of government they are supreme. Would, would we be considered delinquent in our duty like on our earthly duty to just kind of step out and say i don't want to participate yes we, yeah that's how i think of it now and 
because Never. the result is if, if enough citizens do that, then the government can run amok and do whatever it wants, like a Frankenstein monster, and the government is out of control. And that's what tyranny is. When the government no longer obeys the law, you have tyranny. And I don't understand, I know, yeah, absolutely. And I don't understand how um, people could say, you know, the government or the ruling powers, God gives the authority, the ruling powers. I just tell them, that's another thing I say, well, it's the constitution, but I also say to them, you are the ruling powers. Yes, well, look, so. at, look at Article 4. <laughs> Article 4 puts the point on it really clearly that the people, the people of the sta this state have the sole and exclusive right of regulating the internal government and police thereof as mm. a free, sovereign, and independent state. That is, the police are our servants. They are uh, put in that position in order to serve us, to protect our God-given rights. They're not there to violate our God-given rights, because if they do that, then they're not under our authority any longer. We are not regulating mm. the police. They're doing whatever they please, just like Frankenstein's monster. When it went out and began doing things that Frankenstein didn't want it to do, you got a huge problem. You got a monster running amok and out of control. And that's what our, our government has become. Um, you said something about 40, Article 44, and I want to yes, move that quickly and move on to quickly the Constitution, the U.S. Constitution, yes. where, we're, where, we're, where we're violating that. Yes. Yeah, I really want to get both of those in. Look at Article 44 of the Declaration of Rights of Maryland, that the provisions of the Constitution of the United States and of this state, in other words, our Maryland state constitution, our U.S. Constitution, apply as well in time of war as in time of peace, and any departure therefrom, any, any violations of the Constitution, or violation thereof, under the plea of necessity. Mm. That here? <laughs> oh, this is a crisis, this is a necessity. Under mm -hmm. the plea of necessity or any other plea is subversive of good government and tends to anarchy and despotism. That's what Governor Hogan has done. Yeah. He has played the subversive role. He's not doing good government. He's subverting good government. And what he's producing is tyranny, which may well produce anarchy. Because if the people get tired of the tyranny, they will often break out and there will be anarchy. And that'll just well, like yeah, wash and them off. You know? Speaking of anarchy, they're doing, I've, I've seen um, evidence uh, or reports, I haven't looked into the actual orders, but of governors like uh, letting people out of prison and things. Yes, I've heard that as well. <laughs> why, why should we release anarchy. people from prison and then shut down the gun stores? You know, so what is going on? Off. It's like yeah. a it's like a recipe for disaster. You know, it and is I'm fully and that placing be, the tinfoil. Maybe by it. design. I don't know. I can't I can't read their minds, but mm. it sure looks like that. If you want to create anarchy, just empty the store shelves, uh, and so nobody's able to get what they need, and then release all the criminals to the streets so that they can do the evil that criminals will always do, and you have a sure recipe for anarchy that will only invite complete total despotism because the people will only tolerate tyranny for or anarchy for so long and then they'll demand a tyrant just like the french did with napoleon give us a napoleon who can end all this chaos and we will obey him as the tyrant because we'd rather have a tyrant one tyrant than to have a, a anarchy on the streets where nobody's liberty nobody's life and nobody's property is safe or secure mm -hmm. so here i am in in u.s um Constitution. I don't know if I'm even in the right place to look at this. Yes. So there's the Fifth Amendment. Um, actually, that's a summary of the Fifth Amendment. So uh, First Amendment. First Amendment. Yeah. And um, we want to. Uh, where is the actual verbiage? Right, here's the language of it. Congress. <laughs> All right. This is a federal federal Constitution, Bill of Rights, First Amendment. Congress. Look, notice who it's restricting. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or of the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. So here there's five freedoms that are secured by the First Amendment. The first is freedom of religion. The second is freedom of speech. The third okay. is freedom of the press. The fourth is the freedom of the people to peaceably assemble. So the freedom of assembly. And the fifth is the freedom to petition the government for a redress of grievances. So by the way, mm -hmm. the free to, all of those freedoms relate to that last one. Because if you're gonna petition the government for a redress of grievances, often you need to assemble with other citizens to have a discussion about this, to, to work out a plan together. 
And you may need the freedom of the press to be able to print and publish basically what we're doing here on the internet is an extension of the freedom of the press. It is the free press that we're engaging in here. So mm -hmm. each of these is related and it's all based on freedom of religion. That you see, if there is no creator God who, get, who gives human beings rights, then where do rights come from? They come from the government. And they really aren't rights when they come from the government. Rather, they're privileges or licenses. So the government grants you a license. So they grant that church a license to meet. And then they decide, well, we don't think it's a good idea for you to meet right now. We're going to withdraw your license. Sadly, most churches in America, whether they realize it or not, have entered into an agreement either with the federal government, specifically with the IRS, through a five- Oh, wait, look, that's Maryland right there. Or oh, it is. Okay. <laughs> well, they, they've entered into, most churches have entered in an agreement either with the IRS by being a 501c3 or with their state government by becoming incorporated entity, a creature of the state mm -hmm. government, which means in both cases, if they're one or the other, if they're both, they have agreed in advance. They've agreed in advance by signing that document to abide by whatever public policy, whatever public policy the government hands down. So if the government hands down the policy that says, okay, every church now has to marry sodomites. You may not like it, but you're a church, you're incorporated, you're 501c3, you've got to do what we, the government, tell our public policy says, you have to marry sodomites. They could do that. I sat in the General Assembly of Maryland when they were debating, the only thing I can call it is sodomite unmarriage, and uh, debating this whole thing, and they said very particularly, and they were very careful to say this, oh, oh, we're exempting churches from this legislation. Churches are exempt. In other words, we're granting them a special privilege. We're granting them a right, license. Right. Or they don't need a license for something that's already like, a right. When they grant you this license, they can remove it anytime they choose because they are the ones that have given you the privilege. They can take it from you. That's the difference between a privilege granted you by government and a right that's given to you by God that's inalienable with the Declaration of Independence calls inalienable rights. That means nobody can take them from you. They may violate you, you and violate those rights, but they cannot take a right from you because it's given to you by God. And you read the Declaration of Independence, that's the whole foundation of our country. They said the king has violated our God-given rights, and the king is a tyrant for doing this, and therefore we no longer are, are going to be part of his government because clearly his government does not protect our God-given rights any longer. And mm -hmm. therefore, we're going to form a new government designed to protect our God-given rights. Right. So, well, we're not there yet, or are we almost there? <laughs> <laughs> are we almost to where we need to start a whole new thing? Yeah. That's always the question. Um, yes. <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, I just wanted to bring up these pictures while you were talking, just so people can think, can look at the craziness. Because today, I brought this up. It doesn't really apply to Protestants as much. but you know, people were saying, oh, they can, we can have online services and we're still like obeying God's command to convene or to assemble gather together. Do not forsake the assembling. What's the, what's the scripture yeah, verse? 1025. All right. And, you know, we're, we're still doing it and like we're being selfless, you know, and no, you, you're actually being, it's compulsory. Okay. You're, you're not being selfless. You're just doing what you're told to do. And, and you, that, 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 there's nothing selfless about that. You're making for yourself feel better because you, you know, you think you're doing something charitable by staying home. Like, wow, good job. But uh, then I, I, I keep bringing this up that there's people who believe that communion is a sacrament and they believe that uh, uh, confession is a sacrament, you know, and then someone else brought up laying on of hands, you know, that sort of thing like that i think that would kind of fit into protestant we believe in like we're not as uh literal about it we but we do believe you can pray for someone lay on hands and and healing can come i mean this completely precludes that as a uh, a right to us and that's part of our exercise of religion so this is all provided for in the amendment we reviewed correct yes right so the first amendment is being violated uh, but the federal government, you're right, has not been the one right. to, to impose this. And if you notice the language, it says Congress. So this limits Congress right. alone. Really, we need to start, turn to each of the state constitutions. Okay. To see, because all those state constitutions have these same protections. 
the freedom of religion, freedom of, the, of speech, freedom okay. of the press. All Let's... these five are in each of the state constitutions as well. Uh, okay, and, where would I find that? Uh, religion. Let me just type religion. Well, freedom of religion is Article 36, that as it is the duty, and notice what Maryland's constitution is amazing. Notice what it states here. As it is the duty of every man to worship God, every man should be worshiping God. We shouldn't be closing the church doors. Every man should be joining in worship of God and worship God in such manner as he thinks most acceptable to him. Notice the capitalization. Mm -hmm. He is lowercase. That's the worshiper. Him is uppercase. That's God. And then it goes on to say all persons are equally entitled to protection in their religious liberty. Uh, obviously, we're not being protected in our religious liberty when we've been told you're, you're in violation of this edict and we may arrest you or imprison you or whatever. They, they plan to do to those who violate their order to shutter the church. Uh, but um, so it goes on to say that you should not be molested in your person or state on account of his religious persuasion or profession for his religious practice, unless under the color of religion, he shall disturb the good order, peace, and safety of the state, or shall infringe the laws of morality. Where are those laws of morality given to us? They're given to us in the Bible, God's word. And therefore, when the jihadist, the Mohammedan says, my religion requires me to behead anybody that's not a Mohammedan won't convert to Islam. Mm -hmm. That's what this is referring to. That's under the color of a false, fake religion. Mm -hmm. And so under the color of religion, the jihadists cannot say, I can go around beheading people and you cannot uh, try me as a, as a criminal for murdering people because my religion requires me to murder people. No, no, no. That's a violation of the laws of morality given to us in the Bible, not in the Koran. Because if you were to argue that the Koran allows him to his religious practice, the Koran requires him to cut off the heads of infidels, anybody that won't become a Mohammedan. So it gives you an opportunity uh, to become right. a Mohammedan. So that, that's this compelled. You pull that escorted yeah. off in your head, you know? Right. Not, not ought, nor ought any person to be compelled. Yes. To, is what to you're saying. Right. Worship or maintain or contribute unless they're under contract to do so, nor shall any person otherwise competent be deemed incompetent as a witness. To oh, it. that's good on stuff. Account, wow. Notice this. On account of his religious belief provided in other words, you can exclude those provided he believes in the existence of God. No atheist ought to hold any office in Maryland, ought to be a witness in any courtroom or a juror in any courtroom at all. Why? <laughs> he denies the existence of God. Why would you trust that. his oath? He's swearing an oath to a God he does not believe in. You would not trust the word of an atheist because he yeah. does not believe in eternal judgment. He does not believe that one day he's going to stand before Almighty God. And as the rest of it says, under his, capital H, God's dispensation, such person will be held morally accountable for his acts and be rewarded or punished, therefore, either in this world or in the world to come. In other words, he's either going to heaven or hell. An atheist not believing in God, not believing in heaven and hell, not believing in eternal rewards and eternal punishments or even temporal rewards and punishments by God, such a person should never be trusted with any power uh, in, in our system of government. That's what Article 36 clearly declares. It's, uh, it's this would not read. even be a difficult read for no, most no, people. No, this, right. this is a quick read. You could probably read it in a half, three quarters of an hour. <laughs> seven articles of the, uh, our declaration. I've never read it. <laughs> so, Go to print it I'm out, not... carry it with you in the car. So if you get pulled over by a police officer, ask him some questions about his oath of office. Did he swear an oath to uphold Article 44 of the Declaration of Rights? Because if he did, his actions by pulling you over, unless, of course, you committed a crime or, you know, mm -hmm. a violation of the rules of the road, unless you're doing some violation, and he pulled you over just to check, why are you out and about? <laughs> he is in violation of Article 44 of the Declaration of Rights. Mm. And, and could you point me to where uh, we would get freedom of assembly? I, yeah, I didn't... Just, um, hang on a second here. Let me glance at my index. Um, Oh, by the way, look at just for a moment to uh, Article 29, because this relates to what sure. is also taking place with the militia on the street, or not the militia, the standing army, i.e. the National Guard, that standing armies are dangerous, dangerous to liberty mm -hmm. and ought not to be raised or kept up without the consent of the legislature. The governor mm -hmm. cannot call out the army, the National Guard, only mm -hmm. the state legislature. Yeah, they uh, keep saying that. They're like... 
it's like he wants to pass the bar. Bu- I, I think Trump is playing it smart. Like he knows, like if he violates the Constitution, he's gonna get, he's gonna get in trouble with his constituents. And, <laughs> and so he's like, he's like, I, I heard that in the task force yesterday. They were like, he wants the governor or the governors might call in the national guard. I'm like, you can't do that. <laughs> no. Well, go to Article Forty as well. While while we're in that section there, sure. Freedom of the press and freedom of speech. Article 40, that the liberty of the press ought to be inviolably preserved, that every citizen of the state ought to be allowed to speak, write, and publish his sentiments on all subjects, being responsible for the abuse of that privilege. In other words, if you Mm -hmm. slander or libel, obviously that's not what's being permitted, but uh, within the God-ordained boundaries of freedom of speech, there's no freedom of blasphemy, there's no freedom of obscenity, those are not freedoms under God's law. God's law never gives you the right to do that which is wrong. Think about that in regard to murder. Murder is never a right, it's a wrong. Therefore, you have no right to murder. Uh, so uh, take every, all the other commandments. You have a no right to steal. You don't have a right to do what is wrong. Therefore, you don't have a right to blaspheme God. You do not have a right to say uh, obscene things or publish or print or put on the internet obscene things because God's law. Sure. Yeah, but I was going to say, what if, you know, where's the where's the debate like there's a is there a constitutional jury or because if somebody is like well this isn't really blasphemy i was just saying that this is like unto this or so i don't you know i'm not saying well, this is where, god either. that that would happen in a court where the jury is basically the ultimate arbiter of whether what yeah. was done was actually blasphemy or not um okay. And and going back to Article Thirty Six, like the like, are you talking about the judicial system, like the Supreme yeah. Court uh, from the well, bottom up, circuit court, court the, the, the circuit sh- court where you have a jury trial, yeah. a jury of your fellow citizens, a okay. jury of your peers, should be the one that uh, that is determining that. But going back to Article Thirty Six, really, our right to assembly is included in that because it's the duty of every man to worship God. And to worship God means to worship him in a community of believers. And therefore, we cannot be prohibited uh, the assembly of ourselves together uh, as, a, as a body of Christ to worship God. So freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, freedom of the press are all secured in our Constitution in Maryland in different places. Uh, but uh, you could take the entire First Amendment and find all of it there in our, our Maryland Constitution as well. Mm-hmm. Okay, so you... So theoretically, then, uh, if we were just under the U.S. Constitution, then governors could violate freedom of assembly. Right, if their constitution permitted them to do so. However, (laughs) in other words, constitutions may not be perfect, which is why there's an amendment process to say, hey, we made a mistake here. But a good constitution should secure the rights of the people, all the rights that are included in our U.S. Bill of Rights, in a good state constitution will be found there. And again, I have not studied all 50 state constitutions, but I studied a number of them and it's clear you can find each of the uh, uh, 10 Bill of Rights in those state constitutions that I've studied to this point. And- uh, Okay, well, what about um, the assembly, just uh, small businesses and like somebody who wants to have a party, like what are they, like you can't say this to you can't you can't say like 10 people or less that's just totally unconstitutional am i correct or no you're correct and um, under which provision here or otherwise go to, go to article 26 okay and this really is a fourth amendment protection in the sense that article 26 that all warrants by the way a warrant means that a crime has been committed the government has ascertained there has been a crime committed and therefore, in the investigative process that will, they hope, ultimately lead to a trial, they need to do some research, they need to find some evidence because a crime has been committed. But if no crime has been committed, no warrant can be issued because there has not been a crime. The mm-hmm. crime, there must be a crime. Therefore, when the NSA spies on us, as they're doing right now, right. they are committing a crime. Mm-hmm. They are in violation of the Fourth Amendment. They have really, no they, honestly authority. like the CIA is the worst, but anyway, <laughs> they have no authority to spy on us because yeah. there is no legitimate warrant that can be issued because we have not committed a crime. There's no crime committed, so they're doing the government pre crime thing, 
you know, we suspect that a crime may be going to be committed and therefore we're going to spy on you right. uh, in advance. That's completely well, pre, illegal. Pre-cog. Yeah, pre -cog that's, that's illegal. Crime so the all warrants, minority report. Which... Yes, all warrants without oath or affirmation to search uh, suspected places or seize any person or property are grievous and oppressive. Notice what it's saying here. If there's going to be a warrant issued, the officer calling for the warrant to issue must swear an oath before Almighty God, before the Lord Jesus Christ, which he will stand endangering his eternal immortal soul on judgment day. In other words, there's going to be a lot of people that go to hell for all eternity for violating their oath when they issued a warrant. Like how about all those FISA warrants that were issued against Trump? And the people who issued them knew that they were lying and there was deception. The whole thing was a fraud. Those people are going to hell unless they repent of their sin. So that the warrant can only issue if there's a probable cause that a crime has been committed in some way, the person, the place, the things are related to that crime. You can't just, as it goes on to say, issue a general warrant, a warrant uh -huh. that says, we're going to search everybody regardless <laughs> of whether you're- Well, that was the Patriot Act too. Exactly. So and that, that, uh, that uh, um, all general warrants to search suspected places or to apprehend suspected persons without naming or describing the place or person in special are illegal and ought not to be granted, which means the police yesterday in Severna Park that were pulling over every car going down Ritchie Highway into the, uh, and, and shuttling them into uh, uh, Starbucks mm -hmm. to question them, that was an illegal, that was a violation of Article 26 and I doubt that there was any citizens there in Severna Park that had a copy of their Maryland Constitution and knew it well enough to say, sir, dear officer, didn't you swear an oath to this Constitution? Look what Article 26 says. You're doing a general warrant that is illegal. You're breaking the law, sir. You're acting like a criminal. In hmm. fact, if I had the guts, maybe I would arrest you because you are now a criminal in violation of Article 26, the supreme law of the state of Maryland that you swore an oath to uphold. And furthermore, officer, you're going to stand before the Lord Jesus Christ on Judgment Day. You're going to have to give an answer for this day that you're violating your oath of office. And if you do not have forgiveness of this sin that you have committed today, my friend, you are going to hell for all eternity. Is it worth all eternity? to continue to violate your oath of office, sir. If, if your officers command you to do this violation, you ought to quit this job. It's not worth you going to hell. I love your soul too much to allow you to go to hell for violating your oath of office. Amen. So, sir, I urge you to repent of your sin and your crime against the Maryland State Constitution and we, the people of the Maryland, uh, this Maryland uh, uh, Commonwealth. Right. And I wanted to just bring attention to this, caught my eye, and I think this probably is maybe the most applicable thing I found. You can correct me if I'm wrong. That no man ought to be taken or imprisoned or deceased of his freehold, liberties, or privileges, or outlawed or exiled, or in any manner destroyed or deprived of his life, liberty, or property. I mean, we got liberty, we got, we, we're, we're being imprisoned, yep. we're being deceased of our freehold, liberties, and privileges. The only way that can legitimately, legally happen is it's by a judgment of our peers. That is a trial right. with the jury of our peers who are making the determination, is the law legitimate and making the determination, is the punishment legitimate, and is this person actually guilty of any crime at all? Right, and or by the law of the land, which right. could, could they get away on that technicality? Well, no, because the law of the land is only legitimate if it's constitutional. Okay. So the governor's edict is completely lawless. Mm -hmm. It's not the law of the state of Maryland. It is lawless. It is against the law of the state of Maryland. He has no lawmaking power at all. He's the executive branch. They don't make law. They only enforce the law that the legislative branch passes. But if the legislative branch enacts a law that is illegal, then that law is not valid. Okay. And... Um... What I wanted to do is apply this to the Rodney Howard Brown situation mm -hmm. and um, kind of give an update on that. Uh, I went ahead and watched like his follow up and he was granted bail. Well, first of all, Rodney Howard Brown, uh, he's in Tampa, Florida, right? And um, he's uh, arrested for holding services last Sunday. And 
you know, he's got what, 4,000 people. So, right. oh my goodness, he put them all in danger uh, with this 63 death toll, this monumental 63 uh, people dying in the streets from coronavirus. How dare he risk their lives like this? And, uh, you know, and, and so he said he knows the sheriff and he knows, uh, he said he believes he's a believer and all this, but it's like he was being really, really easy on this guy because he said, I forgive him. But he said, I am not going to hold services next week because oh, he caved. And then he said, I'm not caving. He said, he said, I, I got to protect my congregation because he had so many threats. He said he had so many threats from people just who who were mad at him. And he's, you know, he's made his statement and he said, but the spotlight is on them so much that people might come. And I, yeah, I mean, I do want to know exactly what you think. And I'm not going to, sorry, I don't want to editorialize, but sure. I'm just so proud of him for like what he did, you know. Yes. So it's hard for me to like abandon him. But he, he said he has to protect his congregation from a tyrannical government. And also you had said that the state, the governor did relinquish yes or, the governor of florida DeSantis, did say that you know we're not going to shut down churches any longer churches can meet but the, awesome. the number of 10 people per room or something like that i guess is still maintained what yeah that see that no well, yeah, that's not let, good me, let me just use the illustration of the church in elgin illinois that two weeks ago they met and then the sheriff came and, and shut them down but the the pastor was arguing with the sheriff saying wait a minute this edict says that you know 10 people per room we have 50 rooms in our church. There was less than 500 people here. So we were within the edict. And they said, <laughs> oh, that doesn't matter. It was an issue of optics. Because people see you're open, they will also do it. And therefore, it doesn't matter even what's on paper. The edict itself doesn't matter, which means the sheriff gets to interpret the edict any way he wants, which means mm -hmm. the edict itself is not a fixed standard. It's like yeah. a, a piece of bubble gum. You can stretch and squeeze it and turn it any, into anything you want. Mm -hmm. That's tyranny. That's tyranny. Right, right, right. Well, so I would I, say, you know, if if Rodney Brown is closing because he wants to protect his congregation, that's commendable. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I, I was curious. I, I, wish, I wish he had an ability, though, to say, um, we're going to disperse our congregation into multiple meeting places and we're going to continue to worship in those meeting places. We're not going to tell people that they have to stay in their houses. Right. We're going to have multiple meeting places where they can disperse in smaller groups so we're less likely to be attacked. By the wicked ones who targeted, yeah. You know, but uh, I don't know that he has the ability to do that on a, on the fly, you know, a quick thing. I hope maybe by Resurrection Sunday, he might. Right, uh, that's my thing about this: is it seems like a real direct challenge. Oh yeah. By God, or He's allowing us to be challenged because it's Palm Sunday, and, and Resurrection Easter, which is Sunday our biggest. Palm. That's our biggest that's celebration of Christ. I mean, and they're shutting it down, and Satan is having a. a field day dancing a jig because he loves it that the church of jesus christ has submitted to his right. wicked uh, uh, government governors who are demanding that christ not be honored on palm sunday christ not be honored on resurrection sunday well those governors can and should go to hell mm -hmm. because if they are servants of satan that's where they belong in hell and earth would be a better place without them mm -hmm. and we've got um uh what's his name um abbott though he did he like took took it away he, he's allow he's allowing us to meet or them okay. them to meet um uh, hold on uh it's um yeah what do you generally think of governor abbott uh, while i, I look for it generally <laughs> doing, doing a good job there in, in texas um don't know all the specifics but generally yeah. I was a little disappointed. Didn't he declare martial law or was that just some I'm... I'm well, I, I haven't kept up on all the details, but yeah, uh, if he declared martial law, then again, he was in violation of his own state constitution. All right, I got it. This is good news for you if you haven't seen it. Um, Texas governor de deems religious services essential. Mm, good. <laughs> Wow. Good. Yeah. 
Abbott issued an executive order relating to statewide continuity of essential services. Yeah, that was my thing. It's like they're breaking the rules for like Walmart and Target, right? People are gathering and yeah. we're exchanging goods and people are like scanning stuff. And, and it's like they know that it would look really bad to make a line where you can't, you know, go into the store if there's 10 people in there. So it seems like they are, are following some, the rules. There are some stores doing that. I know of a uh, grocery store in Annapolis that only allows one person in when another person leaves. That, that that's just like <laughs> never never buy from vote with your dollar like never yeah. go to those people ever again i left barnes and noble like when non-essential businesses were still i i he was like there's already 10 people in here so you have to wait and i was just like i just drove away uh, well actually he was like i can allow one in because it was me and my wife and then I just drove away because I was just, and I kind of like made it, I don't know, I'm a bad Christian because I just made like a face at him. I'm just like, you know, <laughs> like, I don't, I don't respect that. I, it, it's very silly to me because I'm an educated individual. I mean, mostly, you know, <laughs> I don't want to say I'm super smart, but I know a couple things about bacteria and viruses and we've all learned this as a society that viruses don't spread that readily i mean they do you, you know you should have some sense like don't lick doorknobs and things and you know but we are all using doorknobs all the time and you're not going to wash your hand i'm sorry you're not going to wash your hands every time you use a doorknob you're not yeah. going to do it and you know you're not going to use your sleeve actually i'm kind of scared of doorknobs because i don't like people's lotion so that's my thing that's that's just me i mean i i think that stuff is immediately annoying you know but but viruses you, they're you, completely undetectable completely uh impractical to worry about something like as tiny as a virus to me it's just impractical yeah all of it <clears throat> so um what was I gonna say? Getting used to this interface here. Yeah. Um, so what? Yeah, like you said, I mean, he's uh, Rodney Howard Brown. You you've opined that you know it's fine for him to do that. What what would you do, or what would you recommend to all the pastors? Like wait until they get the hit, and then if if there's a danger, or I I say they all step out and and yes, just do I, it. I would agree. I think pastors should say. This is a time where we ought to obey God rather than men. Man commands us to shutter our church. We want to take precautions. We want to want to keep our congregation safe. I've advised my congregation that if they're concerned or if their their health is, you know, their immunities are low, you know, make those decisions based upon their own uh, care for themselves or if they believe they're infected. Maybe the loving thing, love your neighbor as yourself, is not to be in the presence of others, but make it based on that decision. Don't stay away from church simply because the government has commanded that. Rather come and worship uh, under those circumstances. And I would encourage all the pastors across America to do exactly the same thing, mm -hmm. to make Palm Sunday, a Sunday where we worship the Lord Jesus Christ who triumphantly entered Jerusalem, praised and heralded as King of Kings and Lord of Lords, which is indeed what he is. Today he's sitting on the throne room of heaven and he's coming back to this earth to reign over this earth with absolute control over every corner of this planet. And all those who are on this earth will have to bow the knee to the Lord Jesus Christ. They'll have to confess with their tongues that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This is coming. So why not do it now? Why not uh, uh, say, Jesus Christ is Lord. Governor Hogan is not Lord. Mm -hmm. The federal government is not Lord. The CDC, they are not Lord. Jesus is Lord and we will obey him and we will trust him uh, to protect us. And uh, indeed, right. that's what I encourage every pastor to do and encourage Christians who are in churches that their pastor isn't uh, telling them man up. You know, it's time to, to step forward. Church How about the ones who's, since the beginning. How about the ones whose pastors are not doing it? That Do you think that that would be, I think that would just be a really great way to show faith for mm -hmm. somebody to, start their own or or go to a different church and just or they could like, come up and join us online as a group of 
right? There's some group of believers in their living room and join us online. Again, our, our church website is cefcmd.org and you just click on live event on the, on the first page there, the website, and it'll take you to our worship service uh, when it's live. And when, it, when it's finished, then it will take you to the last week's worship service. So you can watch last week's uh, worship service and sermon. Uh, Which I recommend you do if you didn't see, or if you're watching this, this is this will give you the full opinion of Pastor Whitney. And he's, he's been analyzing, um, he's been analyzing the current events through the lens of, of biblical wisdom for like you have six years of stuff. So 20 years, but you can go watch six years of things of uh, sermons and messages about this. And, um, but I want that we're almost done, but I just wanted to say or ask you, has this ever been done? Is this or is this like the worst you've seen it as far as our religious freedom being infringed? This is the first in these United States that churches have ever been shuttered. Yes, King George III made churches that stood for the Patriot cause. He made those churches specific targets of his soldiers. And if you've seen the Patriot, you see a church being burned. That actually happened. Now, not necessarily people inside the church being burned to death, but churches were burned by the red coat soldiers as persecution. But you know what? The Church of Jesus Christ did never cease meeting during the Revolutionary War. They never were intimidated by those red coats and their evil minions. They continued to worship the Lord Jesus Christ. They were not afraid. And then you take the other wars, the war between the states, that terrible, unnecessary, bloodthirsty war. Christians continue to meet. They continue to worship uh, in spite of edicts by a, a tyrant Lincoln during that time. They continue to worship and continue to meet. You see, they recognize that the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ is greater than the kingdom of this world and the kingdoms under the lords and masters and politicians. No, that's a lesser kingdom. The greater kingdom is the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ because these kingdoms will all fall. The states will fall. The United States of America ultimately will fall, but the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ will never fall. It will never fade away. Well, so many people love this, uh, love the laissez-faire, the apathetic approach to it. It's, it's, it's yeah. creeps into your brain of like, oh, it's whatever, just gonna be a couple weeks. And I, I keep saying like, you, you, you gave up your right. And when you, you surrender you, them, Yep, it's very hard to get them back. You let church become illegal. And yeah. that's always like that's always gonna be a mark on our records mm -hmm. that we let this happen. And that is what mobilized me this way. I'm not I'm not a very uh organized person. Uh, you know, got a lot of struggles with my health, but this like God just attuned me to it and he sharpened my senses just that little bit to push to uh, really, I want to get on my contact list and just, if I were going to go on my contact list and just email every single person and text message every single person and Facebook every single person in the instant message box and really get on everyone's nerves, what would be the message that you would write? Just like a one or two liner thing. Go to church Palm Sunday. Find a church that's open. Our church is open, Cornerstone Evangelical Free Church. If you'll go to our website, send me an email there, uh, mm -hmm. and I will send you the location. But uh, go to church this Sunday. Defy the unconstitutional, illegal, and immoral against God's law edict of the governor telling churches to close. I'm writing it down for myself, and I'll write it at the bottom. Sunday, Palm Sunday, this Palm Sunday. and defy the immoral edict you said yes immoral unconstitutional edict unconstitutional edict of the governor the governor yeah and i kind of almost want to say something about like church is illegal i mean that that's the craziest thing is that a correct Yes, and unprecedented, unprecedented, right. never before in the history of our country. Right. Un right. In fact, that was the whole reason the pilgrims came in the first place, for religious freedom.
for the so first time in the history of our nation. That's how ironic that the exact opposite is what's happening today. And you're, you you know, know. like the pilgrims say, no, 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 we will worship the Lord Jesus Christ. Absolutely. And um, somebody said to me that um, it was done in 1918 from the Spanish flu. And I, I didn't confirm or... Know. Well, I'd have to research that, but I don't remember reading any, I mean, I've read a little bit about the Spanish flu, but I don't remember reading anything about shuttering churches. That'll be our last point. If we can disprove them, that would be icing on the cake. Were churches shut down for Spanish flu? But not definitely not in your lifetime or your parents' no. lifetime. Or, no. or in the history of the rest of the, the period of uh, 19th and uh, 18th century. Yeah, I mean, just some other crazy stuff, like a, a pastor w- said something to the effect of, you know, where it, this is not because of the government or whatever, it's just because of we're being selfless. And it's like, well, that's really convenient, you know, really convenient for you to be selfless right when the government is making it difficult for you, probably a 501c3 to, uh, to operate. Yes, and by the way, that's the interesting thing about this bailout money, $2 trillion. Churches are going to be able to get in on it. I should put churches in quote, 501 not churches. the <laughs> religious organizations can get in on this. If they have complied with the public policy, those are the language that I've read when people have summarized how churches, and churches in quote there, uh, can, can be part of this. Hey, I've got to run and grab this call. Yeah, yep, yep. I'll show him this. Um, here we have an article that does say in Charleston, the Navy struggled to control the outbreak. Local health officials had to make difficult and sometimes unpopular choices. Ringling Brothers was planning to bring its circus to town that fall and circus organizers wanted a show to go on. But health officials were pressing for widespread shutdowns of public spaces, churches, schools, and businesses. A circus and an epidemic? The governor eventually stepped in and negotiated a limited run. There were bans on public gatherings and interesting discussions about whether churches should remain open, said Jacob Steer Williams. It was pure chaos. So there were discussions. So whoever told me that was lying. So there you have it. And um, that's all we have for today. Uh, we went over a little bit, so Pastor David, uh, Pastor Whitney had to run, and um, thank you for listening, and come, if you live in Maryland, to Cornerstone, and because uh, we'll be having services this Palm Sunday, and um, I, re- I just can't recommend enough that you just get on the horse and, 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 and just make a statement in this crazy time when church is illegal. God bless and take care. Thanks.